first time we came to, to Prairie Bible was the result of an invitation. When we walked in the door, it was, everyone was so caring and welcoming and treated us like we'd been there for a long, long time. We're huggers, we welcome people. It seems like they're always comfortable with sharing what's on, on their heart. I, I like Sunday so much, I always say I wish we could go like twice a week. It's, it's great at Prairie Bible. It's a good feeling. The campaign Faith, Hope, and Love fits us perfectly from a culture perspective because it's scripture. The very name draws us back, brings us back to the foundation, which is, a, is God's word, God's scripture. The foundation that we have, our DNA, our culture, is the thing that needs to be emphasized because I truly believe that no matter how much we grow or how much things change, if we continue to embrace that identity that God birthed us with, that's gonna be the most important thing. We have maintained our core identity because we have chosen intentionally to be simple, authentic Jesus. The value of adding space, worship space in particular, in terms of a larger sanctuary would eliminate the need for multiple services. We've always put a value on our togetherness, our cohesiveness as a group, and the relationships we build from that. We think that's an important part of our DNA here at Prairie Bible Church. We don't want to just be an exclusive club for certain people. We want the church to be for everybody. We just want it big enough that everyone can, you know, spread out and feel comfortable and feel like they belong. This campaign will, will just grow and make us better to reach others, and that's what we're all about. We're a mission church. Hands and feet of Jesus. I think the biggest thing if someone's considering giving and they've never given before is just start small. Maybe don't overthink it too much. It doesn't have to be a big donation. It's really a heart feeling more than anything. Being a part of the church and helping it grow so that we can get new people in the door and help them grow in their faith and understanding God. And I just would like to make sure that there's a, a church home big enough for the future families that want to join Prairie Bible. Every church, regardless of what stage of development it finds itself in, is called to grow. But for us to be Jesus to that community, we have to have the tools to facilitate the ministry that we've been called to. That is to spread God's word, the love of Jesus to our community, and, and these facilities are gonna help us to do that. God wants more than anything else to be in relationship, and relationship needs to be top priority for all of us. Well, good morning, church family. How are we doing today? That was better than first service. Don't tell them I said that. I'm gonna get these clipboards going here. Uh, if we have not yet met, my name is Billy. I'm one of the pastors here. For all you Iowa Hawkeye fans, I want you to know that I was watching last night fully prepared to wear my Iowa Hawkeye shirt if they won. They came up short, so here we are. But I was rooting for them. I only have a couple things to, to point out before we get back to worship. Uh, the first thing would be that we have an all-church meeting today coming up right after this service, and we're going to cover three areas in that meeting. First of all, we want to celebrate the life of our church in 2023. If you're like me, it's easy as we look forward to forget to turn around and say thank you for all that God has done. And so we want to celebrate all those things that He's been doing in our church over this past year. We're also going to vote on the slate of the board nominees and then Pastor Craig is going to walk us through the pastoral transition process. So feel free to grab some coffee. There's some great treats back there to grab something after service and to come back in here for our all-church meeting. The next thing I want to point out is Christmas Eve is right around the corner. Man, it's really snuck up on us this year. And this year is a rare Christmas Eve in that it falls on a Sunday. So what we're going to do for services we're going to have three services. Uh, the first two will be at our normal morning times, 9 and 10.30, and then we're going to add a 5 p.m. service. Those services are going to essentially be the same across the board, so just remember that when you're thinking about which one to attend. The only difference would be at the 5 p.m. service, uh, there's going to be a candlelight portion. 
So we look forward to seeing you then. There's actually, um, I think, some forms on the back table that have those service times. If you want to give those to friends, uh, feel free to bring anyone you'd like to our Christmas Eve services. Okay, that's all I got. Let's bow our heads and pray. Lord, it is always a blessing uh, and a privilege to be able to come in here on Sunday morning and look to you. We thank you again this morning, Lord, for what Christmas is all about. The fact that you sent your one and only son, born in a manger, who lived a perfect life and died on the cross for our sins. In the midst of all the gift giving and travels, help us to not lose sight of that. Point our eyes toward you this morning, Lord, and bless our worship songs. Bless Pastor Craig as he gives the message. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, we're going to continue worship with a couple of Christmas songs, guys.
Father, I just pray that we can keep our eyes focused on you this season. God, I know there's a lot of distractions and joy and excitement coming from this time of year that we can just have gifts and family and food and all these great things. God, I just pray that we can just be able to set our eyes on you. Remember what you did, that you were veiled in flesh. You did come down here and you were pressured by every single thing that we've been pressured by. You felt every pain that we felt and you endured it all for us that we can have a relationship with you. God, you mended what we can't mend. And I pray that we can just remember that you humbled yourself. So let us be humble in front of you. and Just be humble in this message. Hear what you have to say. Whatever you're trying to say to us this morning, that we can just be in your presence, praise you, and thank you, God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. As the deer panteth for the water so my soul longeth after thee you alone are my heart's desire and i long to worship thee you alone are my strength my shield to you alone may my spirit yield. You alone are my heart, desire, and I long to worship Thee. Amen. Merry Christmas, everybody. If we've not met, my name is Craig, and I'm one of the pastors here, and I'm thrilled that you are here today. The way we, um, what we do at this particular point in our service is we invite our kids to come forward. Yes, and they're excited about it. And what we ask you to do is, as they're coming forward, let's extend a hand towards them and pray God's blessing is on them as they head off for uh, their life group, okay? Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for our kids. Uh, and for the witness and the testimony they are to us and to the world. We pray, Lord, that the anointing of your Holy Spirit would fall upon them and their teacher as they head off to their life group, Lord. I pray that the, the, the seeds from the Word would be planted in their hearts, Lord, and that the Holy Spirit would nurture them and water them and bring forth fruit in their lives. And I'm praying the very same prayer for ourselves as we, in this uh, space, delve into the Word and discover the plan that you have for each of us, which, of course, is you, Jesus. So love them, love us, and um, help us, Lord, to remember to be Jesus to the world in everything that we do. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. You guys can head that way. I hope um, in the midst of this Christmas season, you've come um, looking to make it all about Jesus, because that's what we're going to make it all about in this church and in this worship service today. There's, that is not to say that, that all the trappings of the, the Christmas season, as Adam alluded to in his prayer mo- a moment ago, aren't wonderful. I love them all. Um, but we need to be reminded and we need to be grounded um, that this season, that Christmas, is all about Jesus. Because the world's not going to get that, right? Therefore, we as the church need to be reflecting Him in everything we do, especially during this season, but all throughout the year, right? So I hope that's why you came today. I hope you're enjoying the the Christmas caroling. That's all wonderful and all that stuff. But um, remember that all those songs and all the, 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 the things that we do pointing us to Him, to Jesus. How many of you have ever heard of Freeport, Illinois? Raise your hands. First service, there's a whole bunch of people, just a few of you. Um, just outside of Freeport, Illinois, I've shared this with you before, uh, was, I w- w- is a little town called Florence Station, Illinois. It's not, I, wouldn't, I don't even think it's a town, to be honest with you, because it's about five houses, uh, Grinnell, or a grain elevator, and a church and a cemetery. That's all that consists of uh, Florence Station, Illinois. And that was where my first church, or the, where I was a pastor uh, many, many years ago. And... Uh, I loved those people. 
because when I, the fact that they allowed me to be their pastor was kind of miraculous and probably lacked judgment because I didn't have any idea what I was doing. <laughs> but I did know that I loved Jesus. And they, they gave me the foundation for ministry that I've been building or that God's been building on me for the last 40 years. And um, it was at that church that I preached my first Christmas series. And it was, I preached this series uh, um, from the perspective of Mary, and one week it was from the perspective of Joseph, uh, and the next week it was from the perspective of the wise men, and then finally of, um, of the angels. And I did a great job, by the way. My first time! <laughs> Luckily, no, Lisa is the only one that was there. So the rest of you just have to presume I did a great job. And every year since then, I have been... Um, preaching and teaching the same story to whoever would listen during the Christmas season. Uh, I've tried to be uh, a little nuanced and maybe share it from different perspectives uh, and, and maybe hopefully in, in different and creative ways, but it's the same story. For 40 years, I've been, I've been teaching and preaching on this nativity story, this story of Christmas, which is why I, I stand before you today to confess that I've been doing it wrong for nearly 40 years. And I'll tell you why. Just recently, I, I had an epiphany. It, it wasn't anything new necessarily, but I began to have some dots connected for me with regards to the Christmas story. You see, um, prior to this year, when I thought about the Christmas story. In the beginnings of the Christmas story, I always presumed and have taught that the Christmas story, the beginning of the Christmas story, occurred in Bethlehem. Or to even put a finer point on it, um, that it occurred on that day when an angel appeared to a teenager in Nazareth to proclaim that God had chosen her by his sovereign grace to be the mother of the Messiah, right? We know the story, Mary. But that's not the beginning of the Christmas story. You're saying, but pastor, I've known this story my whole life. That is the beginning of the Christmas story. Well, no, it's not. There's actually the beginning of the Christmas story, from an earthly perspective anyway, um, actually began 2,000 years or longer than that, before that day that the angel appeared to a teenager in Nazareth. And Understanding that or connecting those dots are important for us to understand what Christmas is really all about, to understand that Christmas is really part of a larger plan that God has to save the world, to save you. So um, I don't know if you all have received in your mailboxes this week these uh, postcards. These are postcard invitations to, um, there's actually 18,000 of these went out this past week. And um, they went out to people in Cedar Rapids and in uh, um, Walford and Fairfax and Ely and Shuville and Swisher, all over the area, inviting folks to come and join us here at Prairie Bible to uh, explore the answer to the question that is presented on these cards. Who needs Christmas? Now, you may think that sounds like a, well, every, that, the answer to that, that's a simple question with a simple answer. You think you already know, don't you? And you probably already do. But before you jump to any conclusions today, for you to um, more fully understand the answer that you think you probably already know to this question, I want to share with you the story behind the story. Because the story behind the story will help you know why the answer you think you know is so important. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to open them up to the Old Testament book of Genesis chapter 12, which is found on page 10 of the church Bibles, if that's what you're using. Because actually, um, the Christmas story, from an earthly perspective, the first time it's really talked about is right there. In Genesis chapter 12, um, the earth was relatively young. Um, but even though the earth was relatively young, it had already become quite a mess. 
It was such a mess by this time that two times in the earth's short history, God had already had to intervene two times, as I mentioned, to keep us from destroying ourselves. The first one you probably are familiar with, probably both of them you are, at least from a Bible story perspective. But what I need you to hear is that God had to intervene in the flood. You know the story of the flood, right? And he had to intervene in the destruction of the Tower of Babel because we human beings, our sinful nature, had played itself out in such a way that if God didn't intervene in those moments, it would, we would have destroyed everything. So, our sinful nature caused God to intervene in the mess that we had made in of the world. Now, you need to understand, as, as I pause here in the story for a moment, what you need to understand is the fact that everything was a mess at this particular point in history did not come as a surprise to God. God knew that we human beings were going to mess everything up. But he believed it was worth it to, to allow it to happen. And, and because God, more than anything, wanted to share his love with, with his children. But I need you to hear me. God, knowing that he, 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 had, he had created these image bearers, which is what you are. You are an image bearer of God. Did you know that? He created us as his children to share his love with. And in so doing, he created us as his children with something called free will. And he knew that when he created us for free will, that our freedom would oftentimes lead to sin and brokenness. And that our sin and brokenness would be played out in some horrific ways. But it was worth it. Because God didn't want children that would be like robots or puppets. I, I've told this story many times before, but it bears repeating. When my, when my kids were little, I'd come from, home from, from church or wherever I was at a meeting. And, and um, I could have made them, because they were little and I was bigger than them. I could have made them run up to me and give me a hug. But I didn't want them to feel that way. I wanted them to want to come up and give me a hug, right? You understand? That's what you would want too. That's what any parent would want, not to, to make their kids feel obligated to love them, but to choose to love them. Well, that's what God wants from you. So he created you with the freedom to choose whether you would respond to him in love or not. He's already chose to respond to you. Now the question is, in your freedom, will you choose to respond to him? Will you choose to be a part of his plan? That free will is our greatest treasure and in some respects our greatest curse because of the way it's been played out, because of the way it's been lived out in the world. And as I alluded to a moment ago, had God not intervened, it would have just, we would have destroyed everything with our sinfulness. So what, what needed to happen? Knowing that there was this tension between um, the fact that God knew we were going to make a mess out of things if we had free will, and knowing that he wanted more than anything else to be able to choose freely, he knew that there was going to be a mess in between and that there needed to be a plan to reconnect his sinful children with who he was as pure and holy God. And what happens is here in Genesis chapter 12, God begins to cast the vision for his plan. So um, let's, first of all, um, God in his sovereignty chooses a vessel named Abraham or Abram. We know him as Abraham, but he, at this point in his life, he was known as Abram. And you need to understand something about Abram. He was a mess just like you and me. As you read the story, one of the things I love about the biblical story is that God never pulls any punches. He never like sets it up and everything's just, everybody's just, he, he, we see by reading Abraham's story that he was as messed up as you are. 
Yet in God's sovereign grace, he chose this messed up human being, just like you, to begin the plan that would save the world. Watch this. Let's read it together. In Genesis chapter 12, starting verse 1, it says, The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. He's casting a vision. And I want you to hear something about what I'm saying here. Abram was a sinful human being just like you and me. But the thing that, that made him kind of different was that when God asked him to do something, he said yes. He didn't even ask any questions. Well, at least it's not recorded in the scripture. He just, by faith, if God asked him to do it, he did it. And here, God, without even telling him where he's supposed to go, where he wants him to go, he says, he says I want you to go from your country. I want you to leave your family, your father's house, the, that which was, has been your home your whole life, and I want you to go because I'm going to make of you a great nation. I'm going to give you this new land, and I'm going to make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those that bless you, and him who dishonors you, I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So did you see it? Did you hear it? Look real close if you didn't, because in that passage of Scripture you will find the earthly beginning of the, of the Christmas story. Look at verse 3 again. He says, And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. What God was saying to Abram in that moment, even though he didn't know, all he knew that he, God said, uh, God's going to bless the whole. But he didn't know that, that what he was really saying was that through this great nation that he's going to create, from, this, from his lineage would come a Messiah that would save the world. What Abram didn't know at the time was that God was so sold out to this plan that would save the world that he was willing to leave his throne in heaven to become one of us, to fulfill the plan. What Abram didn't know was that, that when God did that, when he left his throne as heaven, to come and, and he would come as a babe lying in a manger, right? That's where we think of the Christmas. But he didn't know any of that. He didn't know that God would come not as a, as a, as a conquering king or as some great general of, a, of an army. He would come as a babe lying in a manger, Born to an unwed teenager in a culture that if they had been left to their own devices and they had known what was really going on, they would have chosen to stone both the child, God, and the mom. He didn't know any of that. He didn't know that this plan that, that God had established that he had alluded to here in Genesis chapter 12. He didn't know that the plan actually had a name. And the name is Jesus. Without Jesus, the world has no hope. The world will try to come up with all kinds of other alternative plans of salvation, None of them are good enough. There's only one that is good enough. And his name is Jesus. That's the plan. Jesus is the plan. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, God answers the question, who needs Christmas? We all need Christmas. Every single one of us. It's through Abraham, that God will bless all the families of the earth with a plan whose name is Jesus. Jesus is the plan. It is so easy in the middle of 
the Christmas season and all those traditions that we love. I mentioned last week that I, I love all the traditions of, of Thanksgiving. I do. I love all the traditions of Christmas even more. All of them. But we can never lose sight of the fact that that stuff that you love about Christmas is not the plan. Jesus is the plan. Jesus is God's plan. And there in Genesis chapter 12, God begins to share the plan with all of us. The question then becomes, what is God's plan for you? Well, I'll tell you. God's plan, God's hope, is that you'll become part of His plan. As I mentioned earlier, God loves you enough to let you make your own choices. He's not going to make you run to Him and give Him a hug. You get to choose. But it is God's desire that you will choose to become part of the plan. That you will choose to become part of the family. That you will choose to receive the love that He's already decided He wants to give to you. And you get to decide whether you will receive. And then you get to decide whether you will share it with the world. You get to decide. So how do we do that? How do we go begin this process? Um, we talk about it every week here, right? The, the process begins, the plan begins for you in recognizing that you are a sinner and you are a sinner. That is not politically correct. I know we live in a world that doesn't like to talk about brokenness or, or sinfulness. We try to, in fact, we live in a world that tries to make excuses for our brokenness and sinfulness and call it right. It's not right. You are a sinner and so am I. And the first step in the plan is to confess that. Admit to God and to yourself, I am a sinner. And step number two is to repent. See, it's not good enough just to say, yeah, I know I'm broken. I know I'm a sinner. You must then repent. You must turn from your sin towards the cross. And I want you to notice up here. You notice that that, that cross is empty? See, the fullness of the plan, it, Christmas means nothing without Easter. And the reason why we have an empty cross is because that little baby that was born in a manger that we celebrate every Christmas grew to be a man, would die on the cross from no cause of his own, but from your cause, the cause of your sin. And then on the third day, he would rise again on the third day. And that's why the cross is empty. Because Jesus already won. That's the plan. That's the fullness of the plan. And the question then becomes, are you, do you desire to be a part of the plan? Because God already said he wants you to be. And the way you become part of the plan is then by confessing your sin, repenting of it, and then submitting to Jesus as Lord. If maybe on this uh, first Sunday in December, is the day that you're supposed to make that choice. Maybe you've been going to church your whole life and you've heard this same story in nuanced and creative ways for years after years. But maybe today is the first day that you've actually heard the story and you understand the plan. If that's you, right over there is our prayer room. And it'd be my privilege to uh, lead you in that prayer of salvation and lordship. If there's anything else going on in your life that, that you may need prayer for, I'll meet you right over there.
Well, Pastor Craig, from one preacher to another, Christmas means nothing without Easter. That will preach right there. So thank you for that. That is a great reminder. Uh, When I think about faith in the Old Testament, the person that comes to mind more than anyone is Abraham. Abraham is just this amazing picture of faith, isn't he? And it's amazing to think about how the Christmas story, it begun as a story of faith. Sometimes it's easy to forget how Abraham's journey began, which Pastor Craig pointed out this morning. God just told him, start walking. He didn't even give him the destination. He told him to leave everything and start walking. And it says Abraham obeyed and went. And you know, I firmly believe that God has a plan for each of our lives. But often the greatest blessings that happen in our life begin the same way that it begun for Abraham. When God says, step out in faith and start walking. And I don't know what that means in your lives today, but maybe God's asking you to do that in one way or another. So let's go into this week and into this Christmas season walking by faith like Abraham did. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful that we serve not only an all-powerful God, but a perfectly good God. A God that didn't leave us in our brokenness, but instead sent His Son, born of the Virgin Mary, born in a manger, to die on the cross for our sins, so that we could be in here 2,000 years later, worshiping Your Son and worshiping You and having peace with You. And in the midst of all the gift-giving and traveling this Christmas season, help us to not lose sight of that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, before I say have a great week, you are loved, just remember that we have an all-church meeting in here right now, so we'd love to have you get a snack, some coffee, stick around. Have a great week. You are loved.